Good afternoon and welcome to Hamblin University's webinar on the trial of former uh, Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin accused in the death of George Floyd last year. My name is David Schultz and I'm a distinguished professor of political science here at Hamblin, also an attorney and will act as a moderator today for today's discussion. Before I introduce the participants, um, here's a brief summary of what we hope to do today. We're not here ultimately to discuss the merits of one side or the other or to reach any type of a verdict or to evaluate the arguments. We are here to help you, especially those who are to understand what's about to happen think over the next few weeks uh, in the upcoming trial from both points of view, prosecution and defense. And I say we think because we have a also in terms of what happened um, with, the, um, with the case this morning. Representing at least the prosecution point of view, or at least talking about it from that perspective, is the first Korean American chief prosecutor in the United States. Um, uh, he prosecuted Your Honor Yanez in 2016 shooting of Fernando Castillo as Ramsey County attorney. Um, he served as St. Paul attorney from 2006 to 10, and was from and is from 2015 to 2015 recipient of the Minnesota County Attorney Association Award of Excellence, an organization of which he's also. John Troy, thank you for being with us today. I very much appreciate your time. And then representing the defense viewpoint today um, is William E. McGee, Public Defender Award of Excellence, given at the federal state to the job as a public defender. He has argued and won a case before the Minnesota Supreme Court, argued before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1998, He's an adjunct professor of law at Mitchell Hamlin Law School, where he teaches the school's legal assistance, the Minnesota Prisoners Program. Brad Colbert, thank you again for being here as well. And we appreciate your time for both of you. So again, remember what we're gonna to try to do today is really explain um, perhaps almost to the level of, of, let's say at the novice level, you know, for people who might not know very much about the law, what's going on here. And, um, and again, we, my original plan was for us to start with jury selection in terms of putting it together. And I still think I want to start here, but I want to just mention, maybe we can weave this into our conversation, that the judge uh, was supposed to start, the prosecution and defense was supposed to start jury selection this morning. It's been delayed at least until tomorrow because of some pending issues before the minister. Maybe we'll come back to that in a few minutes here. But I want to direct it to both of you, you know, to John and um, um, and to um, um, Brad. And you know, people are going to hear this term called volunteer. You know, I've already had students ask me questions about it. From your perspective, so maybe I'll start with John. Can you explain from your perspective how jury selection works? What's void dear? What, what do you folks do when you do the selection? Thank you, David. Can you hear? Can you give me a thumbs up if you're hearing me loud and clear? Because I was having difficulty uh, hearing you, David. But I think I got the gist of the okay. uh, questions that you were posing. You want to start out with uh, jury selection and kind of demystifying kind of how all of that works. And so I want to just also begin by thanking Hamlin for um, uh, putting together this forum so that uh, people in the Hamlin community can have a better understanding of this really big, important uh, moment that we have right now in our community as if we are on the eve of uh, the trial. I guess it was supposed <coughs> to start, but it's going to start possibly tomorrow, but there's still a lot of legal things that need to be decided. So, and, I, and I'm glad to be here on, on, the, on this uh, webinar with uh, Professor Colbert. Um, and to try to explain all of this to everybody. So from the standpoint of how jury selection, pro the process works, I think in many ways um, the public has this notion that somehow uh, somebody is maybe handpicking who gets to be on the jury. And that's uh, not true. It's really a process of what I call um, deselection. So it starts with this notion that in Minnesota we should have randomly selected jurors uh, from a pool and that pool would be comprised of people that have uh, registered to vote, who have states or uh, IDs, right? And so that's all put into a, a, a computer kind of a thing. And then 
a list is generated. I don't know exactly what the process is in Hennepin County, but I can speak to Ramsey's process. There would be hundreds of people who would be called for jury service on a particular Monday, right? And then from there, depending on what's going on, uh, they'll have a random group of people, um, a smaller set assigned to various cases. Now, in this particular case, uh, I would imagine that uh, they've done all of that work and they're ready to go and they've got their group of 50 or 100 people that they want to have potential jurors. In Ramsey County, in my case, uh, it was a group of 50. And then, of course, they're going to randomly number the people. So let's say it's 50, it's one through 50, right? And, and that's done randomly by a computer program. But that actually does matter because uh, like in my particular case involving Adrano Yanez, I felt like the order of that random number selection really mattered because from a standpoint of who you might want to agree, from a prosecution perspective in that particular case, I felt the demographics and the information that we received prior to the process starting through the jury questionnaires, there were better people towards the bottom uh, of the people that would be more desirable from a prosecution standpoint. But at, but at the end of the day, uh, we get what we get. And then what we do is through the process of these questionnaires, we can kind of figure out what kind of questions that we wish to ask. Sometimes the judge will ask them. Sometimes the parties can ask them, but usually it's agreed to in advance. Um, and then through those questions, you will get to the uh, determination of whether or not somebody uh, could be a good juror, right? And so this is an adversarial process. Uh, there will be rules that have, have been already established so that there would be uh, for uh, those who would be removed for cause and those who would be, and then the, their, the prosecution and the defense uh, would be given peremptory strikes uh, to remove somebody for uh, no reason so long as it's not a race-based reason. Um, and the rules that are set up for this trial, I believe, in, in Minnesota, we allow the defense to have more of those strikes than the prosecution. So I'm not sure if it had been a county if they're using the 9-5 rule or the 12-9 rule for this case, but that matters as well. And so through the questioning, um, we're going to try to figure out who might be those uh, people that get moved on uh, to the next, uh, to, to be seated as jurors. And so it's a complicated process. The judge oversees that. But through the adversarial process, we hope uh, we get fair and impartial jurors. And I want to also note that just because you know about this case doesn't mean that you can't be fair and impartial. Uh, but through the questions, uh, the, the question will ultimately be posed. Um, you know, based upon what you know or what you've said, can you be fair and impartial? And if a juror, a prospective juror says that they can or they have trouble articulating how they could be fair and impartial, uh, they're typically going to be removed. Brad? Yeah, he, John, John's exactly right in that he, um, you know, with this process, you first try to determine whether someone can be impartial juror and then that's when then you can strike that person if, if they don't believe that they are impartial. The judge may strike for cause, or one of the parties may strike for cause, or may make a motion to strike the cause for cause. The judge has the ultimate choice about whether the person can be stricken for cause, and there could be lots of different reasons the person can be stricken for cause. So that's the even the first question going through the judge's mind, and then as John suggests, the next issue then becomes. This kind of the more more of an art, I think you would say, when the attorneys try to decide which demographic or which particular, you know, like what books do they read, or who, how would be good for our side, not you know, not just fair, but who would be good for our side. And I, you know, there's been lots of books and lots of studies done, and I still think it's much more of an art than a science. Also, during the jury selection, notice it's a time for the parties to kind of educate the potential jurors on the case and they'll ask questions that relate to the case so they can get some sense so the jurors can you know get some sense of what this case is about and you know as an attorney you always are trying to advocate for your side so you're kind of trying to make your case during jury selection although you know the case the trial hasn't officially started you're also, I think, trying to ingratiate yourself, ingratiate yourself to the jurors. You're trying to make yourself and your client, and you know, more likable. They, you know, that's a piece of this as well. So it's a really, a, a complicated and a difficult 
uh, thing to go through, and especially in this case, where there's going to be so much publicity before the trial, that'll be, makes it really difficult. And even more so, I would think, in this one, because of the looming protest. And I haven't really heard much about how that's going to be handled, but that's a really difficult question as well. Usually it's about, you know, have you heard about it and can you be fair? But then it's a matter of if you've heard about it, are, you know, are you worried about the protests would also seem to be something I think uh, I would as an attorney would want to know. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me do a couple of follow ups here on this here is one of them is in the sense of I've had a lot of people say to me that, uh, well, is there a particular racial makeup that has to be on the jury here? Um, now, I know I think both of you mentioned that you can't exclude people on the basis of race. But is there anything that would require, I'll just make up a number here, that says it has to be um, six white Caucasian and six people of color? Because well, um, or, or is that just not a, an issue? I mean, how would you folks approach that question here? Well, I think that's a really interesting point, but we have rules that have already been set up for this particular process, and we use an adversarial process, and the defense would be duty-bound to, um, you know, work out a way that they would be trying to um, utilize this process to add uh, to a Add, to make an advantage for their particular client, that would be ultimately their duty. But David, I think you raise a bigger issue. Um, it can't be determined, decided for this particular case. I mean, we, we've already got the random group of people and they've, you know, it, it is what it is. But there is an important conversation that we need to have in this country as well as in this state about the racial makeup of our jury, uh, jurors because of other factors such as whether who has a, a driver's license or a state ID, who has, um, uh, who might be disqualified from serving on a particular jury, uh, that we routinely don't necessarily get the uh, racial composition from a demographic perspective of what is representative of a community. And so uh, there's lots of discussion about a jury of your peers, right? So. Uh, when you have criminal defendants or et cetera, who might be subject to the, the sanctions and punishment of a criminal court, uh, it is important uh, to uh, think about this issue because we're not necessarily uh, getting that type of uh, uh, balance uh, in our current system today. Okay. It's an excellent point, right? And so part of it is we have this trial and we're putting a lot on this individual trial but as John points out, we have a lot of work to do within the system. And our, you know, our jury system has a history of racially biased. And, you know, and the, for a long time, prosecutors, I, I, it's fair to say, would frequently strike, strike black jurors from a trial involving a black defendant and until the Supreme Court said that they could no longer do that. And so we have this history that is a part of our criminal justice system and how it plays out in this individual trial will be, you know, is, is a, you know, will be important, but we have to, as John suggests, we have to make, you know, this isn't the end, right? This is just a piece of how we're going to improve the, the criminal justice system. I think the other piece that's interesting is usually the defense attorney is not bound by the same ethical rules as the prosecutor. The, the prosecutor theoretically is supposed to do justice while as a defense attorney, our job is to zealously represent our client. But the Supreme Court has made it clear that the defense attorney cannot strike somebody on the basis of race. And the prosecutor cannot, but nor can the defense attorney. So that's going to make things, I think, you know, theoretically more fair. Gentlemen, just a quick request here. Uh, we were having some audio difficulty at the beginning. If you're not speaking, can you please mute? All right. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. So when I was thinking about this case starting to emerge, two other prior cases jumped to my mind. You know, one of them, now I'm going to show you how old I am. Um, I remember an old case called Maxwell versus Shepard, and it involved what? A, a legendary case of which there was a television series called The Fugitive and eventually a movie. And it was all about a case in which there was you know, a, a doctor socialite uh, accused of murdering his wife. There was so much pretrial and trial publicity that eventually the Supreme Court threw out the conviction and said that it, it was no way he could have a fair trial. 
And then also many of us remember the O.J. Simpson trial, you know, but the O.J. Simpson trial took place just at the birth of what? The Internet, email and before social media. The point that I'm asking here is uh, how difficult is it going to be? To, to hold a fair trial in a situation like this where, as you pointed out, Brad, a couple of us on John, we've got what, perhaps protesters exercising legitimate First Amendment rights. Um, we've got the social media. Everybody has seen the tape. We know what we're referring to here. How difficult is this going to be to do this trial? Brad, go ahead. I think it's going to be really difficult. I mean, and as as John says at the beginning, and I think it's important to note, this is can't. It's not a matter of whether you heard about it. It's whether you can set aside everything you've heard and be fair. And what's really important is that jurors will be asked is to rely solely upon the evidence that's introduced at trial. And so it doesn't. What you've heard before, you can't play a factor in how you decide the case. And as you imagine, might imagine, that's really, really difficult. And so I don't, you know, people say, well, how do you do that? And I think it's, you know, you have to consciously decide to do that. And the, so I would presume then, I don't think they've addressed this as to whether the jury will be sequestered. But I assume that, the, you know, that you'll ask them to be sequestered, which means that you will be kept with your fellow jurors for the entire trial. And that seems like a you know a, a really a big burden to put on people for however long the trial goes, but that will that's designed to make sure that jurors solely rely upon what they've heard during the trial itself. Very good. Yeah, and I think that the uh, the judge can play a really important role. I think one of the most important things is if there are jurors who are you know just uh, stressed out and worried about this. The, the moment here uh, that the judge will be putting in place uh, things that will, um, you know, seek to comfort them in this process. And the instructions that the, the judge, of course, is going to give them will matter as well. And these are standard instructions about that you have to be fair and impartial, that, you know, you can take your life, you know, events, your story to bring it to the table to help influence how you might see things, but you have to focus on the evidence that's been presented before you and we'll, we'll caution them about all the things that they need to be cautioned about and we'll instruct them about applying the law to the facts. And so this process is what it is today in the, you know, I think also too, the, the case that you talk about from a long, long time ago, and then we've also had high profile cases in the state of Minnesota, but we, uh, you know, I guess we figure it out. Uh, and so my great hope is that, um, uh, the jurors will be given uh, the proper support and the instructions, uh, and they will take them seriously and responsibly and ultimately render a verdict. And I think this community will ultimately know what justice is when uh, they, they see it. Very good. Brad? Unmute yourself. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't go through the whole seminar without having somebody say unmute yourself. So I wanted to get that, get that out of the way early. So, um, Got it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I think it is, you know, what we've talked about and what's important piece of this is how this case fits in to the history of, you know, racism and, you know, the criminal justice system and police brutality. I mean, it is, I think it's, you know, the numbers I think, you know, have been a little hard to come by, but I think there's been like 200 people killed by the police in the last 20 or so years. And there have been, I would say three or four prosecutions and they've all occurred in the last five years. And so that's, when we talk about justice, it's going to, you know, that's going to be a hard call as far as at the end of the day. Is justice, whatever the jury, whatever verdict they returned, I'm not sure. And I think so it, it's going to be a really difficult and trying to use this trial, you know, as a benchmark for what justice is I, I think is 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 important, but it's also really difficult because the jury is going to be asked to decide to apply legal principles to the evidence that they have in this case. And we're going to, I'm sure, talk about some of the charges, and they're really complicated, difficult charges. The second-degree murder charge, the felony murder in Minnesota, is a, is a really 
complicated charge. And the depraved mind is even more complicated. And the jury is going to have to ask to be able, so in this individual case, they're going to ask to be decide, ask to decide whether the state has introduced evidence to meet these particular elements. But it's also in the context of a, of a, of a, you know, a system that has, we've not held police accountable. And, you know, we've just lately actually have started charging police who have committed homicide. So uh, how those pieces go together, I think we won't know for a while, but it's going to be a really important thing that we're going to have to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. John, let me go back to you here. We're going to start to move us towards the trial a little bit here now, you know, but again, I've had some of my students ask me, for example, you know, why are there so many different charges being brought up? And again, Brad was starting to hit at this here is that we know right now it is a is second degree murder. It is second degree manslaughter. It, it could potentially be also third degree murder. We just don't know yet at this point. But John, could you talk a little bit about, you know, why are people charged multiply and can you talk a little bit about um what you have to show because brad hinted at it here can you talk a little bit about what you have to show for like second degree you know manslaughter and murder unmute again thank you for that uh i am now unmuted um but i think from a prosecution strategy perspective, there are multiple ways that you could think about like how to charge a particular defendant. So in this particular case from at the very beginning, how this case uh, ultimately was charged and set at like the pretrial hearing was that there would be three charges. Um, you would have the unintentional second degree murder, the third degree murder, uh, and then the um, uh, the second degree manslaughter case. Um, there's a, a view that you might want to take all of the applicable potential charges, throw it out there, and then you're going to have to then present a case that goes to all three theories. There is a difference with these three theories. So the bottom charge, let's start there, of second degree manslaughter, that's um, uh, uh, arguing that it's like a gross, uh, that the officer acted in a grossly negligent way, uh, much more than just, uh, uh, it's culpable negligence. So it's gross negligence plus an element of recklessness. So it's just something that's way outside of what is commonly accepted uh, by uh, police practices or our citizenry, right? So it's a, it's a kind of like a, a, a heightened level of negligence at the highest possible level, border in, in having aspects of recklessness. Then you've got this third degree murder, which right now isn't in the particular, it's not on the table, but it probably will be if at least the Court of Appeals gets, gets its way. But then we got the Supreme Court thing that's still hanging out there. Uh, that's an interesting one because I think that practitioners across the state have a really different viewpoint about what that charge is supposed to be about. The big issue, and it's a legal issue, it's not, not one for the jury necessarily to decide. Uh, but at the end of the day, what if it is on the table, what they're going to be asked there is that it's kind of like this heightened level of just like who would do something like this. It's It was so beyond the pale, reckless, it's, you know, got these ancient words of depraved mind, et cetera, uh, that ultimately the, jur the judge will instruct the jurors of kind of, of about what this means. Uh, but it is kind of like a middle charge because it's not a 40-year uh, um, uh, maximum sentence uh, type of uh, uh, charge. And then you've got the second degree unintentional murder uh, if you cause the death of someone uh, intentional or on, but w with the in the commission of a, another felony um, that would be the applicable uh, charge so you've got but you've so you've got to prove different things for each one of these offenses and so sometimes a prosecutor says you know that's too complicated I want to keep this simple for the jurors and might say that you know we, we're just going to focus on these this particular charge but it seems to me that the way that this is playing out is that the prosecutor is believing in this case without trying to get into the head or the motivation of the prosecution here it seems to me that they're believing that the best thing that the state's interest can do is to put forward all of the various 
um, theories of what happened here and violations of law and ultimately let the jury decide there is value, I suppose, in the context that you're giving a menu uh, for the jurors to choose and they can choose that. Now there is some dynamic about like uh, what the punishment might be for these particular offenses. Um, the, the jury is not supposed to think about those things, but I think intuitively um, they do kind of think about these things within the jury deliberation process. Good, good. Brad, is there a real, tell me from your perspective as, 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 as a defense attorney, I mean, what is this idea of bringing multiple charges? Does it complicate um, your defense? And also, doesn't bringing multiple charges run the risk of what, confusing a jury, which actually, I was going to say, might actually work to your advantage if you're a defense attorney? I, you know, it's a really mixed bag of these charges, right? It's because generally what the way it comes down is you could, it makes sense to me, like if you had, let's say, an intentional murder, or you're usually you, you know, you're trying to decide what the culpable state of mind for the defendant is, right? And, you know, and the idea is, did you do it with premeditation? And the next level, did you do it with intent? And then the next level would be, well, you know, okay, you, were you so, you know, reckless and careless? That's third degree. And then finally, the second degree murder is culpable negligence. I mean, second degree manslaughter. So you have those. And so those are, those, you know, that makeup makes sense to me in the sense of, because then the jury does what I think juries are good at in deciding what was this particular defendant's state of mind when this happened. What to me, the wild card in this one, and the one that, you know, we could spend the entire hour, actually we could spend the next the entire day talking about, but the, the felony murder is a completely different animal because the way in Minnesota in particular, because in Minnesota, the felony murder charge, the defendant doesn't have to intend, certainly doesn't intend, have to intend to kill anyone. And in fact, in Minnesota, you don't even actually have to intend any harm. All you need to do is tend to commit an assault. And the assault is the physical. And so this is where it gets to be, to me, it's going to be interesting to see how the state decides to prosecute this. But for the felony murder, they just have to prove, uh, my reading of this is that he intended to assault. And from it, there isn't any question from the video that there was an assault. By putting his knee on his neck, that's an assault. So the question then becomes, Okay, was that reasonable force? And that's where it seems to me that's the issue in this case. Usually when you have, you know, when you have police homicides, the question becomes, was it an authorized use of deadly force? In this case, he didn't intend to use deadly force. So I don't think that's appropriate. What the question is, was the force he used in the assault reasonable? And if it turns out the jury decides it's not reasonable, it was an assault, and there, and he died. Now, you know, the idea of causation is a different issue, but that's, but just as far as, you know, causation is a separate and distinct, but the felony murder is, I think, just a matter of the assault and the death, and then that's it. So that feels to me different than the third degree murder and the second degree manslaughter charge. Very good. This is a good opportunity for me to read a question from the audience here, and it's from Gita, uh, from Gita from, um, uh, I'm going to uh, Sita Maria, uh, Maria and, uh, from Augsburg University. Her question is, my understanding is that it's rare to get a conviction of a police officer in the killing of a black victim. Is that true in general in these cases, these types of cases against police? And what are the challenges in these cases against police? And how is this case similar or different from others? I think part of what the question is really sort of asking us here is a couple things here. And one of them is, What's what makes it difficult to prosecute police officers? Um, um, is there something special about the law or what's going on? Right. So maybe I can take a crack at that. So the overall conviction rate um, across the country, uh, last time I checked, it was somewhere around 40 percent of these particular cases. So they are more much more uh, challenging and they typically always go to trial. Uh, there's a few cases where they might be plea bargained, but it seems to me like the way that these cases play out across the country is that um, uh, they're put uh, before a jury to ultimately make the, the decision. I think one of the reasons why there has been challenges, um, 
I think one of them is just the, the unpacking this relationship that exists between prosecutor and law enforcement that has existed historically. More and more people are now recognizing that there are uh, certain conflicts or biases that we need to be better aware of and that the prosecutor's role does include uh, holding police officers accountable for police violence. Um, I think that's a growing uh, recognition on the part of prosecution ever since uh, we've had Ferguson, Missouri. So there's evolution uh, that is happening there. Uh, a second piece of this is the law uh, where you, the police officer, generally speaking, across this country has the justification or the, the authorization to use deadly force if it's justified. And of course, they use a reasonable police officer standard. Now, in this particular case, as Brad talked about, I really don't believe that the justification piece or that uh, self-defense piece of, of protecting if you believe that your life was in jeopardy or the life of others was in jeopardy is really at play here. Um, really, I think the issue uh, for what will be before the jury is the first word in the element of, uh, or the, the first prong of uh, the element that needs to be proved for second degree unintentional murder would be causes uh, the death. And that is, I think, is what is going to be kind of litigated and put before the jury uh, through the use of people that can explain this. And there'll be a theory that um, from the defense side of things that uh, the causation does not exist, that there were other factors that might have been in play that contributed or, or was a significant cause of that particular death of George Floyd. And then, of course, the, the, the prosecution is going to argue that um, it, this was a, a major contributing factor and none of those things really matter, and, and he caused the death. So that's kind of what will play out. And so this case is not like some of the other cases where you do have a real uh, legitimate uh, defense where they're going to say, well, I shot the person or I took this police action uh, because I was fearful for my life or the, uh, fearful for the safety of others. That's just really not in play, I think, in this particular uh, case, because I don't think that the police officer can, can legitimately argue that. Okay. Brad? So I think it's really important to point is the idea is we have charged many police officers with this. I think that's, that has been the missing link. When people talk about it's hard to convict, well, it's really hard to convict somebody who hasn't been charged. And so for years, and I, the, it has been, what's been done is it's been gone, you know, I, I'm trying not to say this in a too, but people use the grand jury, I think, to protect themselves. Prosecutors use the grand jury to protect themselves from the difficult politi political problems of charging police officers. And John Troy gets an immense amount of credit for doing, not doing that. Because in every other case, except for, for in every other case, Prosecutors charge by complaint, and they've always done that's how they do, and except for first degree murder charges, but in every other case, they charge by complaint. But prosecutors have hidden behind grand juries and they've said, well, we, you know, their response is that, well, the grand jury didn't chose to indict. Well, what in fact, they didn't need to go to grand jury. And that's, that has changed. And, the, and again, it's a really, really recent change. It's within the last five years that people are, that prosecutors are actually starting to charge police officers. And I think that has represents a sea change and that people are recognizing that police officers, and again, some, you know, and you hear people talk about accountability when they talk about my clients all the time. You need to help hold the defendants accountable. That's what prosecutors are supposed to do. And they have failed to do that with police officers over the years. Absolutely have failed to do so. But that started to change and people are starting to, and they're, one of the ways to do it is starting to charge them and not hiding behind the grand jury. Good, good. All right. So I've watched, as many of us have, I've watched what Law and Order on television for like 25 years or something like that. How are real trials different than what we've seen on television? What, what can people... Um, let's say expect that's different, or what are they going to see that's different? You know, as you know, when they watch this trial, because it's being live streamed now, so people have the opportunity to watch it, which is pretty unique in Minnesota too. So, uh, John, how's how's this different than what we see on our usual weekly segment of of Law and Order? 
Well, I think the first thing is before the trial happens. I think there's a perception uh, that TV uh, gives about the prosecutor's role in how the investigation is conducted. Um, I think it's more based on an East Coast model where the prosecutor is very involved in directing uh, the investigation. And in Minnesota, it really doesn't play out that way. The way that we have set it up is that the police agency, in this particular case, the BCA, uh, is really leading that investigation. Now, because of more public scrutiny, around uh, the investigation and bringing up potential charges against an officer, the prosecutor has realized that they need to be more involved in the investigation. So uh, if certainly in this particular case, in all of the recent cases, the prosecutor has been uh, very involved at the very outset after an incident uh, to be advising and being involved uh, uh, with the investigation. Because at the end of the day, the investigator has to present something to the prosecutor. If the prosecutor says, I want you to pursue uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, they need to do that, right? And so that that's different. Mm -hmm. I think another piece of this too is that in this these types of cases, uh, typically the person who stands accused of a crime uh, is not going to testify um, in these police. And sometimes on TV, they portray it uh, that, you know, there's this moment in the trial uh, where, you know, the, 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 the person gets on the stand and will say something and it will be this big pivotal moment. Um, but typically in these types of cases and in and, and vast majority of criminal law cases, the person who stands accused of the crime is going to exert their fifth amendment uh, right not to have to testify. Um, but you will probably, I think what will need to happen, though, is with respect to the cross-examination of witnesses, um, especially police witnesses that might be trying to be helpful to the defendant, uh, the prosecutor will have to play a role to, to uh, aggressively cross-examine. Okay, good. So, Brad, can there be this dramatic moment in the trial where suddenly the defense or the prosecution calls in the surprise witness, you know, that comes out of nowhere, or suddenly some completely unanticipated piece of evidence comes in, as we see sometimes in what and the Law and Orders and all those other shows? Can that happen here? Yeah, alas, no. I mean, I think that's one of the things people are going to realize. Watching a, a trial can be make watching paint dry look exciting. There's moments of jury trials that are just going to be so dry. There are going to be really exciting moments, though, and really dramatic moments. And one of the joys of trials, it, there is a sense of the unknown. You don't know what the how the witness will be on a stand. And we've all experienced witnesses that have performed much better than you could possibly imagine. And the other side, we've frequently seen witnesses perform much worse. So you don't really know. So there is, there's moments of drama that's going to happen. And you don't know exactly what those moments are going to be. In this particular case, though, I mean, I think the, you know, we do know that I'm curious to see whether Officer Chauvin is going to testify. That's a really interesting question that uh, John has pointed out. But we have a videotape. And that videotape is going to be the most dramatic, as people are going to have to watch that. And I would presume it's going to be played several times during the course of the trial. So that is going to be the most dramatic part of this trial. Yeah. Both of you tell me now, what's the task of the opening statements that both the prosecution and, and the defense are going to make? What are you trying to do um, in, in there um, for, uh, when you speak first speak to the jury? Well, I think for the prosecutor, it's certainly you don't want to overpromise, but you want to give a prelude to what uh, is your ultimately theory of the case. And then uh, at closing, it's that's when you can bring it all together and get them to focus on the important aspects of what you're trying to lay out. So they will uh, play important roles. But I also think that some of the boring part of this case uh, is going to be really critical too. You want to pre present this information and if you're talking about medical uh, information and causation, et cetera, um, the ability to um, ask uh, good questions that will help uh, the juror understand some of the complexity is going to be a real 
really critical piece. So I think oftentimes we spend a lot of time thinking about like the, the value of opening and closing statements, but I think also what happens in between really, really matters, especially when you're talking about real technical information. Okay. Brad. Uh, so the defense attorney gets the option of giving it after yeah. giving it after the state gives their opening statement or they can wait. And so part of it is trying to do for a defense attorney, you have to decide, you know, at, at you don't know sometimes, you don't make the decision as to whether your client's going to testify or whether actually you're going to present, put on a defense till after the state puts on. So the what important piece of this is that the state has bur the burden of proof and proving beyond a reasonable doubt. So a lot of what you're doing as a defense attorney is reminding the juries, jurors of that, of the, bur the state's burden of proof and asking them to wait and to make sure that they weigh all the evidence because, and again, rem reminding them again and again and again that the state has the burden of proving and not just the burden of proof, but the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt. So you want to be able to do those kind of, like hit those marks several times during your open statement. Again, I've seen a lot of defense attorneys wait until the state's presented their case and then they'll give an opening statement because that gives them the benefit of having seen the state's case. And then they have a better idea of how they want to present their defense. So it, a lot of it depends on defense strategy. It's a different than the state has to, I think what they use, you know, in trial advocacy school, they always talk about the roadmap they want to provide because they do have the burden and they have to show the jury, this is where we're going. And the defense doesn't have a burden at all. Yeah, no, this is good. You're, you're segueing into the next couple of concepts. I think we need to explain to to um, um, our audiences here, um, and I'll throw it out to both of you here. You know, one of them is explain what does it mean to say there's the presumption of innocence. You know that we operate with, and with that, you've talked about it here. What does this mean to say that the prosecution has to carry? You know, the burden of proof and burden of persuasion. And then also, I want to throw in here: does the defense have to prove innocence. You throw all those con a lot of questions I'm throwing in here. Right. So on the on the prosecution side, the, the burden is a really heavy one. It's beyond, proof beyond a reasonable doubt and, and that's explained in many different ways. But uh, the you know the jurors have to be convinced of the, the defendant's guilt. But I think the most important piece of this is that um, every one of those jurors has to come to that conclusion through this long process of um, you know hearing the evidence and then getting into a room and deliberating with your peers about the guilt and innocence of a particular individual. But every one of them has to agree on the outcome. And I think in instances or cases like this, there's always that possibility that you might have one or two or three or four people that might have strong views of uh, uh, another particular way. And of course the judge will be trying to get the, the jury to come to a conclusion and keep trying and trying and pushing. Uh, but at some point too, there could be the, the, uh, the aspect that the jury may not agree as well. Um, so that the, the burden is a very, very heavy one. And, you know, the job of the defense attorney is to poke holes uh, in uh, understanding uh, the evidence and creating uh, that doubt. And I, I've seen, you know, very good defense trial attorneys do that, do that very, very well. Uh, by And oftentimes it might be, you know, trying to blame the person who is the victim. Uh, or it could be uh, doing things that uh, would, you know, just ca cause some aspect of doubt so if we're talking about causation, um, a good defense attorney is going to introduce all of these things that would go to how um, it wasn't the, necessarily just the, the knee on the neck that killed uh, um, George Floyd in this particular case. Yeah. yeah. Brad, does the defense, same questions here, but does the defense have to prove innocence? Not at all. I mean, but that's where a uh, strategy becomes really uh, um is important because as a defense attorney, you do not. You could actually, the state could put on its case and then it happens not infrequently. Well, the defense will say, you know, we rest your honor. And then they can argue quite vociferously that they did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So you can argue that said, you know what? We don't have to pre present any evidence and we, you know, rest on the ideas that they did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Then the jurors can, has to, I think that 
sets up that argument really well. When the defense starts putting on a case, whether they pre present the, you know, Officer Sullivan's testimony or whether they present medical testimony, it's a more difficult, it, it is, it just doesn't, doesn't work as well to say, because now you've presented an alternative, right? And so then it seems like, you know, it's just common sense, the juries would be more weighing which one made more sense. And so that, that aspect of it, the defense has to decide whether they should in fact put on a case, because then it makes it more difficult, I think, to explain to the jurors that they have to still have to prove, they still would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And you could then, but then you would say, we presented evidence through this evidence and medical testimony. We don't have to prove the case. All we have to show, and we've shown through the evidence, that they have not proven their case. Okay. All right. I've had several students, and I've talked to, and you probably have heard people say the same thing. And they say, well, it's cut and dry. Watch the video. It's what, the nine minutes video. That proves everything in and of itself. That's all we need to know. Is the, is the video, I guess, that we've all seen um, that conclusive that that it proves the case? That's all the prosecution really needs to show? So I would say that it can't be just about the video. And I think we somewhat learned our lesson uh, in the prosecution of Geronimo Yanez. I think uh, one of our strategies as a part of the prosecution was to keep it relatively simple. And we relied very heavily on uh, the video and the audio of what was said uh, by the own words of the officer after the um, uh, when Philando was uh, killed. And that was not enough. And I think what uh, there's another aspect to all of this, too, which I think in, in the case involving uh, Officer Yanez, uh, you had a, a lot of uh, kind of battling of experts, and their experts did a really good job of, I think, casting doubt on the, our experts' opinions, right? Um, and then another part of this, too, is the, um, and it's not so much the, like the evidence and the instructions that are given for, to the jury, but every juror comes to the table uh, with a perspective or a, a worldview or life experiences, right? It's the lens by which we see all of this information coming to us and how we process it, you know, this in our brains and then ultimately deliberate and come to a decision. Um, that will matter too. Um, it's not something, it's kind of outside of this process of evidence and court rules, all of that, but that does matter. And I do think that uh, the jury lens by which they might look at all of this evidence has also uh, evolved. Um, I think that the way that a community might see the instances of police violence uh, and how they may interpret that video um, has potentially changed from maybe 2017 uh, to today. Okay. Brad? I think that's right. I think John has said it uh, exactly right. I think that, you know, and, and again, I, mean, I, I think 10 years ago, quite frankly, you know, 10 years ago, we would not have had a video. And we, you know, so that aspect wouldn't be there. And we would not have a charges in this case. There were, I'm sure there were, you know, and so we've now got charges. We've seen, you know, we have recognized what it means, you know, to have police brutality. And I think jurors used to be a little like, that couldn't happen. That's they. They just presumed the officers were doing the right thing. I don't think that presumption is there anymore. So I, you know, so I, I agree, with John, that you're going to have to show, do more than just show the videotape. But the videotape is by far their strongest evidence. And you know, one of the weird things about a criminal trial, of course, is we're definitely not going to hear from the other three officers involved. They all, I, you know, they're. You know, their trials are coming later, so they can choose not to testify. And I'm pretty confident they're not going to testify. And it's not clear whether we're going to hear from Officer Chauvin. So you have this idea of the four main participants in, we're not going to hear directly from them. Um, and which is, you know, kind of the unique aspect of our system with the person's Fifth Amendment rights. Yeah. So we've talked about the fact that we have to have a unanimous verdict here. But but let's sort of speculate, cl clarify for people. What if, for example, we let's just say on 
one or both of the charges, and I don't know if the third charge is going to be there at some point now. Let's say we have like a, I don't know, a 10-2 or an 11-1, you know, um, uh, uh, verdict. Uh, and, and they, and they well, what happens at that point? So they go to the judge, let's say they've been deliberating a week, and they say, we're at 11-1. Um, what happens at that point? Well, the judge is going to try to intervene as appropriately, which you know, encourage them to go back and deliberate and get to a decision. And we'll remind them about the enormous effort that the, both sides have um, mm. put into this case, the, the, the need uh, for this community and for the litigants to have uh, a resolution, and they'll just encourage further deliberation. Now, at some point, you can't do that anymore. You can't just keep saying that. But that's going to be the first attempt to try to get to a resolution is that the judge will encourage them uh, to keep deliberating, will answer whatever questions that they can in an appropriate way, and would advise them that um, this process needs to have some form of a conclusion. Okay, so we follow up with Brad on this one and say, uh, what's what's the concept of mistrial mean i mean um is is there a possibility that there could be let's say if we don't get a, a unanimous verdict that there could be a mistrial what does all that mean then yeah no and it's it's a really important point i, I one of the interesting aspect to it is when you we started this conversation about the number of charges and one of the reasons to have those charges is in case the jurors are unable to agree and sometimes you'll get and what the, the the term of art is a compromise verdict and that you, the jurors will amongst themselves decide. And that's interesting to me, the idea of a third degree murder, because they're gonna be presented with second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. And let's say, you know, there are some people who want second degree manslaughter and other people want second degree murder. They may arrive at third degree murder as a compromise verdict amongst themselves. Interesting because, and third degree murder sounds less than second degree murder, the presumptive sentence, interestingly, is exactly the same for both. But the idea of, it's important to remember that when we talk about, you know, the idea of, of mistrials is it has to be unanimous both for acquittal and conviction. So if it's 10 to 2 in favor of acquittal, that's a, that's a mistrial as well. So it has to be unanimous both ways. Right. Can there be a, can there be a, if there's a mistrial, can there be a, um, can the prosecution, um, do another trial. Yeah, absolutely, because there uh, there wouldn't have been a uh, so the opportunity would exist for the prosecutor to retry the case. However, um, it, there comes a moment in time where if you uh, felt like that you can't get beyond uh, the burden of proof, right? Then the prosecutor should take note of uh, maybe the and they can talk to the jurors as well. Uh, but they'll have to evaluate whether or not they wish to retry the case. And you have to put a serious effort into that just because you lost. You, you shouldn't just say, well, I'm going to retry it because, you know, I feel like I want to. You, you should actually investigate and think about why there was a, a mistrial or a hung jury, evaluate the evidence again, and then make a decision, a reasoned, thoughtful decision, and try it again. And then I suppose if you lost, you could try it again, but there comes a point here where the prosecutor then is now becoming a, not a minister of justice, uh, but is probably uh, being oppressive. So, okay, Brad, unmute, un unmute yourself again, Brad. Start and end that way. So John's right. I mean, and part of it, you find out if it's 11 to one, you have one holdout that is holding out for reasons that are unexplained. I think it's really likely that they will charge it again. And, but if it's, you know, 11 to one for acquittal, the prosecution does have the right to re to retry it, but they'd be well advised to kind of go, yeah, maybe we should. So it, 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 but we're a long way from that, that's for sure. Okay. So assuming we get, let's, let's say there's a, um, a guilty verdict on at least one of the charges. Uh, can the defense appeal? Can the prosecution appeal? Prosecution can't appeal. <laughs> never, never at all. Right. That would be prohibited. On, a, on the ultimate uh, jury decision, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the concept of double jeopardy, correct? Right. Well, it just yeah, it depends. A well-known constitutional principle that if jury renders a final verdict, yeah. the prosecution doesn't have the right to appeal that verdict. 
Okay. Okay. Brad, can the, can the, can the defense appeal, even if it's all, let's say, let's say it's on one of the only conviction on one of them. Well, I mean, that's a lot of what's, you know, what's interesting about what's going on now is generally, if you're going to appeal a conviction, you don't, you, it's hard to appeal on the argument that the jury was wrong. It's really difficult for the, to go to the court of appeals and say, or to the Supreme Court and say, look, the jury's just wrong on this one. What you have to do is you have to find legal error. And so in this, you know, that's why I think, you know, I'm a little surprised that the Judge Cahill is um, is pushing forward because this question of whether third degree murder is an appropriate charge is a really difficult issue. And the Supreme Court has just decided to take the case. And so if the Supreme Court in, in the state versus Nord decides that third degree murder isn't the appropriate charge, then, and they ended up instructing the jury on third degree murder, that'll make appeal, it just, a, it just makes that appeal better. And so I, I you know, I, I'm surprised that, uh, that he's pushing this hard and moving forward, given how up in the air the whole third degree murder charges. I'm, I'm curious, is John's take on that? Yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real mess, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with lack of clarity around third degree murder. And there will be a lot of effort and time put into all of this. And so I think it's just better to get that clarity. Maybe the, the judge is trying to seek that clarity from uh, the upper courts, but uh, getting some uh, idea of how the Supreme Court is going to view the Court of Appeals position on third degree murder is really, I think, a critical piece to all of this. Otherwise, we're putting in, I guess, jeopardy this whole process, which doesn't feel right to me. And it feels like it's um, asking people to um, subject themselves to a process that could ultimately be have, have, have to be done again. And there is uh, an aspect of, of causing harm and, uh, to people and community of having to go through a trial all over again if, it, if we didn't get it right. So I hope that the clarity will be found uh, that's needed to make sure that we can proceed. I don't know. I just don't know all the details about it. Um, David, also another point of this, this too is that there is a, a, a parallel from what we have read in the New York Times um, and local uh, journalism here that there's a federal investigation and prosecution as well. And they are a separate uh, sovereign or entity and they can um, also commence uh, a, a criminal action based upon the same incident uh, if they so choose. So they have that as well that's going on right now. We just don't know uh, what's going on with the, if there's a grand jury process that's been impaneled and what they're looking at and what the potential indictment could be. Sure. Because so briefly, we're just about out of time for both of you. I'll start with Brad and then John. Is there one bit of advice that you would want to give to people um, who are watching this trial that what they should be thinking about um, as, as, as a spectator or an interested person? Brad, is there something you'd want to tell people? It's a great question. And so part of it is both to recognize that is the dual roles this trial is playing in that this is a, you know, this is both uh, a trial of Officer Chauvin and trying to determine whether the elements of the crimes with his he's been charged, whether his actions meet those elements. But it's also a part of a larger system in our criminal justice, a larger, um, just a larger trial of our criminal justice system. And what happens at the end of the day on this is just going to be a piece of this. And as John suggested early on, is this, what happens whether Officer Sorbonne is convicted or acquitted isn't going to resolve the issue of police brutality. It's not going to resolve the issue of racism in the criminal justice system. It's going to be one, uh, an important data point, and it's going to be a really important data point. But, you know, if he's convicted, it doesn't mean that we've resolved police brutality and resolved racism in the system. And so I think that's a really important to keep in mind as we go through this trial. Good. John, last thoughts? Yeah, I, I would echo what Brad just said. Um, I think also, too, if you're believing that Derek Chauvin is uh, guilty and he should be punished, I think we should just remind ourselves that the process really does matter. 
about how this all happens. And so this is an important part of our justice system. So I would hope that people are recognizing uh, that we have to be fair uh, in terms of how all of this plays out. And then secondly, as Brad talked about, um, this is a big case. It's a, a case that has worldwide implications. It already has. Um, but the key is, is that for people, as we are learning more about police violence and we're thinking about our justice system, uh, that we can't just believe that this trial is going to be the, 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 the solution to all of that or whatever that outcome is and put everything in, in, in relation to this trial and it defines everything. There is so much work that needs to be done to improve our justice system. Uh, it, I think it's important that, uh, our, our public is now recognizing that more that police violence has been happening historically, and uh, we I believe in this concept of civilian control of our police department, and it's a good thing that our, that our public is inserting itself more about how we have use of force policies, how we might train officers, how we might uh, have accountability over police officers. Those are important evolutions that are occurring, and the work is not done. Great. Thank you very much to you, Brad, and to John. Um, I know we could have gone a lot further in terms of talking about a lot of the complex issues, and which I think is a very complex case at this point. Um, and I thank to all of you who are in attendance today, and I hope you feel a little bit better informed. And hopefully Hamlin will be able to, in the future, do a few more maybe talks like this in terms of maybe educating people regarding some of these very difficult issues. Anyhow, thank you very much. Again, John, Brad, everybody for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.